and welcome to The Short Stuff. I'm Josh, and there's Chuck and Jerry's even here, too. Dave's here in spirit, so it's a short stuff. Let's go. Martian rock. Yeah, Chuck, we did one recently on not just SETI, but, you know, how humans might respond and what the protocols are for talking to aliens. I don't remember what we named it. But um, we mentioned this in passing in that episode because we're talking today about a particular chunk of rock that was discovered on December 27th, 1984 in Antarctica. And it's called ALH 84001. And the ALH stands for the Allen Hills region of Antarctica where it was found. The 001 stands for the fact that it was the first rock discovered of the season. And it was the 84-85 collecting season. So that's where the 84 comes from. And you might say, hey, that's great. That's interesting. What's so remarkable about ALH 84001? And I think we should talk about that in depth real quick. Let's in depth real quick. <laughs> uh, yeah, we should for sure shout out geologist Roberta Score, mm-hmm. uh, who was the person who uh, was out on uh, a snowmobile and saw this thing for the first time. Every time she found one, she'd be like, Score! <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think that would get that good of a response. Way, way too much of I'm that. I'm kind of pleased with myself. Uh, so, okay, so Roberta Score finds this thing. Uh, they bring it back, and it's um, kind of Raiders of the Lost Ark style, uh, stuck in storage for <laughs> a remarkably long time, because they didn't really know what they had on their hands Mm-mm. until 1993, uh, when they finally you know, started kind of looking into this thing a little bit more. And they said, wait a minute, everybody, this rock is from Mars, and it was formed when the Earth was still molten about four and a half billion years ago. Mm -hmm. Uh, And the way they figured it is that there was some cataclysmic event that uh, sent this rock launching out into space, and it sort of bumped around for about 16 million years, and uh, then eventually found our solar system. Uh, What, like 13,000 years ago? Yeah, and it got pulled into Earth's gravity, and eventually it deorbited and landed in Antarctica. Yeah, why is it? It's so funny. It just seems like that stuff never lands in a a suburban neighborhood in Alabama or something, you know? I think it it has plenty of times, but we've just so developed that and moved so much Earth, we just have no idea what, what those rocks are. We're just pushing them out of the way. And I guess there, even though it seems like there's people everywhere, there's still a lot more land where people aren't around for something to land on. Definitely. Or the the ocean, of course. And then also, Chuck, remember, the only person to ever be struck by a meteorite, I think, was a woman in Alabama in like the 50s or 60s, remember? (laughs) Really? Yeah, I I think it was Alabama. So it's it's raining meteorites in Alabama, apparently. Okay, so this thing was special. They realized it was from Mars. And so they started to really take a a, a much closer look at it. Mm -hmm. And the first thing they discovered that uh, really kind of knocked their socks off were these orange grains locked inside of it that they tested and they found were made of carbonate. Uh, and they know here on Earth, carbonate forms when water that has carbon in it flows through cracks in a rock. Mm-hmm. That water evaporates and leaves and that carbon remains. And so they said, hold on a second here. If this thing has carbon, which is an essential ingredient of life, then that might mean this could be proof of life on Mars. And it also says, everybody, that there was water flowing on Mars. Yeah, another vital ingredient for life, right? So this kind of got their attention and focused it toward the idea that uh, perhaps there was some sort of evidence of life in this rock. And they started looking very closely at it. And uh, as the BBC put it in an article that we read, um, they noticed near the carbonate grains worms and sausages that looked just like earth bacteria except much smaller. And that really got their juices flowing. So now all of a sudden you have a team at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory who are studying a four and a half billion year old piece of Mars, uh, investigating it for possibly having harbored life at one point. Right. And we should point out that uh, there were obviously with something like this, there were people that were on what you would call or what I believe you called Team Believe or Team Believer. Mm -hmm. Uh, But of course, also people that said, no, this thing was probably contaminated uh, here on Earth, like some kind of terrestrial contamination. And that explains what we're finding here. So you had two sort of groups 
uh, of, I guess, for lack of a better word, naysayers and believers. Mm-hmm. And they were studying this thing really closely. Yeah, and I say we take a break and come back and talk about what each team figured out. Let's do it. So, Chuck, Carl Sagan famously said extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, right? Yeah. And the idea of uh, a chunk of Mars bearing evidence of microbial life, ancient, billions of year old microbial life, is a really extraordinary claim. So, there was a lot of push among Team Believer to um, find extraordinary evidence to back this up. And like you said, there was this idea that perhaps this had been contaminated terrestrially. And there was a study that was conducted by an entirely different group of people, from what I can tell, that looked at um, other Martian rocks that had been found in the Allen Hills area of Antarctica that had been processed at the same jet propulsion lab in, in a search for something that looked like what was showing up on the ALH-84001 rock. And they didn't find anything. So that right there kind of bolstered the idea that this rock was special and unique and it hadn't necessarily been contaminated here on Earth. That's right. So that's one positive step forward for life on Mars. Mm -hmm. Uh, More and more people, I think, started to kind of fall into the team believer camp. Um, But there was one person, a uh, a specialist in uh, microscopy or scopy. Sure. What are we saying? I'm going to say microscopy. Oh, well. Mm -hmm. (laughs) All right, fancy pants. Yeah, I'm feeling Um, like Grey Poupon here. Do you look through your microscope? Yeah, yeah, I do when I examine my Grey Poupon. Uh, So so this person joined the team um, basically saying uh, or or advising them, hey, we may want to hold our horses here Mm -hmm. uh, because we don't want to make fools of ourselves by going public with some findings that I don't even know if I believe. And uh, she started looking through this thing, obviously, through a microscope. And when you get down there in – uh, microscopic land it's they describe it on the bbc as terrain uh, which is kind of cool like the terrain of this rock and saw these little black grains uh on the rims of uh these carbonate globs yeah and they were very very tiny just nanometers in size and she learned that these were magnetic crystals made of iron oxide and iron sulfide which was another big aha moment Yeah, they're like really tiny compasses. They're magnetic. Um, And it turns out here on Earth, they're actually a byproduct of a specific kind of magnetotactic bacteria. Nice. Which is a cool word once you master it. (laughs) It really is. And it's it's a byproduct. It's a process of life that produces these little um, magnetites. It can also be created in other ways, right? Non-organically, non-biologically. But to do that, to create these little magnetites, nanometers across, um, non-biologically, it requires really, really high temperature, really, really high pH, and uh, an environment that's not at all hospitable for life. But that also means it's an, an, an environment not at all hospitable for liquid water. And since they had basically essentially confirmed that liquid water had deposited those car- that carbon, um, it would have had to have been liquid water that, um, I guess, housed whatever bacteria that might have right. created those magnetites. It was, to, to put it differently, it was another check in favor of the idea that something living had once been on this rock. Right, found by someone from Team Naysayer. Yeah, who, who again, like she had come on to, I think, to kind of save her colleagues from embarrassment. She started out as a, a genuine scientist is supposed to. She attempted to debunk this. Right. Um, not to be a jerk, but to, again, like sure, that's sure. what scientists are supposed to do. And I think from what I could tell, she was also taking it upon herself to, she wanted to be the one rather than, say, other scientists who might not be nearly as kind or gentle about it. Yeah, I, Team Naysayer gives it a negative connotation. Team sure. Skeptic. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I might as well have said Team Poo Poo Pants. <laughs> I like all three. 
Uh, so the team believer gets back on board uh, to do some more studying. They found organic molecules called uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, PAHs, mm -hmm. that are in these carbonate deposits that they had originally found. And here's the thing. You can find this stuff uh, in the cosmos. You can find it here on planet Earth. Uh, when you char your meat on a grill, uh, they are the – you know, you might have heard that if you grill things in a certain way with big charred grilled marks, there can be carcinogen, uh, carcinogenic compounds. Mm -hmm. That's what that is. Um, and that just occurred to me. That's probably why you don't grill food, huh? Who, is me? Is that why? Yeah. I'm not really f happy about the taste of charred stuff, but also oh, okay. I don't own a grill, so that kind of precludes <laughs> me from grilling. <laughs> All right, so there's a lot of stuff. <laughs> right. um, so that's what the PAHs are, but... Um, they're created as a byproduct of life, which is sort of the key as far as this rock is concerned. Uh, and they found this stuff like when things decay, like in oil deposits and coal deposits. Yeah, from when microbes decay and become fossilized, right? So here's the thing. Again, just like uh, those magnetites, PAHs can exist and be created non-organically, right? which is how they're part of cosmic dust and all that stuff. Um, but again, the way that these the, they showed up in this rock really made this team say, you know, this is exactly what you would expect um, this, this, these PAHs to be deposited in this form if it had been deposited by a decaying microbe rather than uh, happening non-organically, right? right? So again, another big check in another box that supports the idea that life had once been inhabiting this rock rock that was from Mars. Okay, so at this point, it's the mid-90s. Uh, it's 96. It's the summertime. They don't have definitive proof, but they did submit findings uh, in a paper in, the, in science, in the journal Science. Mm -hmm. It was reviewed by a, a very esteemed panel, which did include Mr. Uh, Sagan, or Dr. Sagan? Yeah. Okay. Mr. Oh. Dr. Reverend Sagan. <laughs> Esquire. Mm -hmm. uh, and then NASA got involved and grilled them. And they finally decided, all right, I think we at least have enough to make a public announcement that we have possibly discovered life uh, on or evidence of past life on Mars. And old Billy Clinton got up there, made that announcement. And it was a really, really big deal, as you would expect. I think uh, the BBC reports that uh, within just a few days, uh, a million people had seen the the science paper online, and this is a a science paper. It's not generally the kind of thing that most of the public will like click on and download and read. And people were really into it. There were news cr crews around the block in Houston trying to get a look at this thing. Yeah, in the first week, there were more than a thousand stories that NASA counted on on the announcement, um, and they suggested that the scale of the coverage across the world actually eclipsed and exceeded the coverage of the first moon landing. So, it, like you said, wow. it was a really big deal. I mean, think about it, Chuck. The president of the United States, arguably back then the leader of the free world, um, said, hey, some of our scientists think that they found evidence of ancient life on Mars. Said it out loud in the Rose mm -hmm. Garden at the White House. So, yeah, it was a huge deal. And the public received it pretty well and pretty enthusiastically. Again, they're talking about microbes that existed uh, 16 million years or more ago on Mars. Yeah. But it was still evidence of life. In the scientific community, however, it was not received quite so well. Yeah, you know, I, I think since then, uh, all the evidence has been looked over, and there is there's still team naysay or I'm sorry, team skeptic. Poo poo uh, pants. Team poo poo pants is very much alive, uh, as is uh, our team believer, mm -hmm. and it, the, the jury is still out. It's there's a lot of circumstantial evidence that point to it being life on Mars, and I think that definitely sort of helped kick off a lot of our subsequent research and interest on Mars. Yeah. Uh, just that first little hint. I don't know if you could point like a direct line to funding or anything like that, but it wouldn't surprise me. No, you actually can. I read that it actually created the field of astrobiology, which is pretty well oh, okay. funded today. Well, yeah. yeah. So it was a really big deal. And the fact that the jury is still out, like you said, means that somewhere, I believe in Houston, uh, we have a, a meteorite that contains evidence of life elsewhere in the universe. We just, not everybody believes that's what it is. And they probably put it in a crate and rolled it back next to the Ark of the Covenant. That's right. Uh, you got anything else? Got nothing else. Good one. 
Uh, everybody, Short Stuff is out. Stuff You Should Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.